So just before we get started, as we're still waiting for people to come in, I have some updates and information. Okay. Um, for those of you that are um, genealogy enthusiasts, you should know that it used to be at the New Canaan Library, you could only access Ancestry.com when you were on the premises. That was just the ProQuest licensing that we had. It's the only licensing we could get. Because of social distancing and the pandemic and people who were sheltering at home, ProQuest, which owns Ancestry, and is now offering Ancestry.com to all New Canaan Library card holders. If you have a New Canaan Library card with a barcode in the back, you can go to our website, newcanaanlibrary.org, and if you click on the research button under the Learn ribbon, if you navigate to Ancestry.com, you type in your barcode, it will grant you remote access. So you can do it while on vacation, while at home, late at night. It's a really neat perk that is only available until the end of July. It may be extended. What um, Ancestry.com and ProQuest have done is that initially they extended it through May and then June. So it seems that as while people have been sheltering at home, they've been rolling forward this remote access, which is just a really great perk that you don't have to come on site to the library. You can do it from the comfort of your home entirely for free. Ancestry.com Library Edition does cover international records as well as US records. So um, that's just a really great thing to check out. If you have any problems or issues accessing Ancestry.com through New Canaan Library while you're remote traveling or at home, just send us an email at New Canaan Library. It's online ref at newcanaanlibrary.org. Um, I will put it in the chat um, so that while Tony is explaining a lot of these um, research tips and skills, you are able to access Ancestry from home. That's so exciting. That's it's so really, exciting. it's huge. And Ancestry is rather expensive, I believe. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it's something like $25 or $30 a month, comparable to what you can get through the New Canaan Library for free. And it used to be a little bit challenging because, because they were pretty strict about access. You could only do it if you were sitting at a computer at New Canaan Library. It's just amazing now that anyone can access it for free from home. Um, do you, and unless you bought the subscription, which is about $200 a year, do you know if they're extending that to all libraries or is New Canaan paying for that? It's being extended to all libraries. It's sort of a national program. It. Yes. Um, so what the library, most libraries are aware of it. If they have done it, they, they usually are promoting it on their website. It's something that's coming from Ancestry.com, not New Canaan Library. Okay. All we had to do was go into the back end and reconfigure the access so that our patrons can use their barcode and access it from home. But that's been up and running for a while now, and they've confirmed access through the end of July. Wow, so that's exciting. So everybody that's listening, take advantage of that, you know, at least till the end of July. Maybe they'll extend it, but if not, you can work at home because I know lots of people, most of my students in Ridgefield don't or, or even in Reading don't have their own subscription because they don't need it because we have access through where we're teaching. And I always say, why pay for it if you can do it here? But um, obviously, since we're not available to go to our learning centers, that's a great thing. I, didn't, I was not aware of that. I was not told that, unfortunately. So everybody, when you finish with this, you can get off quick and start researching. Yay. Oh. Um, for those of you that, are not, that aren't familiar with Tony and Tony's lectures, Tony McKean has been doing genealogy research on her own extensive Italian family, her husband's Irish family, and son-in-law's German family for the last 30 years. She now has more than 9,600 family members entered in her Family Tree Maker program. She's a member of several genealogical organizations and has been teaching for 14 years. She is now the chairman of the Genealogy Club of Newtown for the second time in a row. Um, today, Jean, Tony's going to show us how to bring a special relative alive with an in-depth study of his or her life. And Tony will break it down in small steps so that you can learn how to print out and create a book for many generations to cherish. 
Tony is a fabulous speaker. She has quite a following and we're very lucky to have her here today. So thank you so much, Tony. Thank you so much. Um, Bob Gager, I just see you signed in also. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, today we're gonna talk about, I mean, we're all genealogists, so we all love research. Invariably, people have said to you, oh, you're doing genealogy, how far back can you go? And that's always a challenge for us, how far back? Well, people in the 1700s, we really can't relate with. In addition to going back and going sideways, I really think it's also very important to go in depth with one person of your family, usually it's a parent or a grandparent. And that's a great hook. You know, our children, we were not interested in genealogy when we were young. Our children are busy now being full-time parents and careers, they're not interested, but one day they're going to be. So something like a book like this will be that hook and they'll read that and they'll say, gee, that's really exciting and they'll want to know more, hopefully. The caveat on this is, and my students know, yeah, I do a general overall, which gives you an idea of what we're going to be doing, but then we spend time in class and we'll spend a week doing the geography of the place and we'll spend a week doing some research on a data and we'll spend some research on a um, military. So we spend a, a, a time in class for an hour and a half or two hours rather, working on one little phase of it. This is a big project, it's not hard. It can be as simple as you want, it can be as elaborate as you want, but it always should be fun. So, putting flesh on the bones of an ancestor. If you do have a question, put it in the Q&A because then I can see it. Again, copy down my email at the end after the lecture. If you just send me a quick email, please send outline. I'll be happy to send that for you. Okay, so how did this all come about? I was teaching and one of my students years ago came in with a book, it's called The Orphan of Ellis Island. Uh, it's a paperback, fairly small, very simple, fabulous. I'm a visual person and what this does, it's about a little boy who um, was an orphan and he's on a class trip to Ellis Island within a, a I think he was an adopted family or foster family, desperately wants to know about his family and the story goes on. I love the look of the book. They did it on a very soft tan paper. I love the font. I love the headings. I loved everything about the book. So I went home, I read the book, and I came in the next week and I said, we're gonna write a book. And everybody looks at me like, ah, oh, you gotta be kidding me. I said, no, no, we'll break it down. I had broken it down into steps. I said, this is going to be a wonderful project. Well, some of them I had pulled screaming and yelling. Others jumped at the opportunity. But in the end, they all produced books that they were so proud of. I have some students who have done now four books. Four books, one of the ladies has done five. So once you get that first one onto your belt, the others go, of course, so much easier because you're more familiar with it. So that's how we got it started. It's a children's book in the Ridgefield Library, it's in the children's section. It's by a woman called Alvera Woodruff, and it's a very quick, interesting book. But it visualizes. You know, we all talk about, oh yeah, they got on a boat and they went to Ellis Island. Well, they talk about what was it like on the pier when they arrived there? What were the sounds? What were the smells? What was, who was saying what? I mean, it really grounded it. I love the book. Okay, so while we're gonna be writing this, there's a couple of things that are very important to keep in mind, very important. Number one, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's not perfect. When I go through some of the books that I've written, and I've written a couple now, I did both my grandfathers, my father, um, an uncle, two uncles. Um, you go through and either you'll find a typo that somehow you missed, or a date that was now you realize was wrong, or um, for whatever reason, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's not gonna be printed. I always said to people in my classes, it's not a competition. I'm not gonna read them out loud. You're not gonna hand them in and I'm gonna give you a grade. This you are doing for you. So relax, it's fun. Secondly, it's not gonna be published. I mean, if you want, yeah, you could publish it. You can self-publish certainly, but we're not putting this on the bestseller list. So don't worry about that. Number three, it's not entering a contest. I'm not gonna say, oh, Jane did a fabulous one, but Paul did one that's, uh, he's not so good. No, it's not a contest. It's not a contest. This is for you. It can be as long or as short as you want depending on your time, your capabilities, your interest. Naturally, the longer it is, the richer it is, the more information is there, but you don't have to say, I'm not gonna quit till I get to 100 pages, because that's a lot of pages. Number five, depending on your computer skills, it can be as elaborate or as simple 
as you want and still look wonderful. One of the people who I know is listening here is Bob Yates. Well, he's a really computer person. And there are things that he can do that most other people are going to really struggle to do. But it doesn't matter. It can be very simple. And again, when we were in class, I talk about some of the skills on how to wrap the text around the picture and make it a little bit more professional and how to change the fonts and the colors. But it doesn't have to be fancy. It can be simple. It's still going to be wonderful. The other thing I want you to do is write yourself into the book. Otherwise, you go to the library and you pull a book out of the library, a biography of somebody, and when you open up the cover on the dust jacket, usually there's a little blurb about the history bio of the person, a couple of sentences. No, this is your book. If you, I want you to put in, if you go to a cemetery and you were looking all over the place in this big open field and you finally found the grandfather cemetery, yay, how excited you'd be. Or if you went to a particular, went, drove to the town and you saw the little street and you took the pictures, put that in there. Put that in there. This is time that you spent digging this up. It makes it very enriching and it puts you in the book and it puts your relatives now know the kind of effort and time that you put into it. Not that you say, oh, I did this and I did that. No, it just makes it more personal. All right, so write yourself in the book. I have one student who took her mother after she had done this research, went up to um, upstate in Connecticut, and she took her mother to the house where the woman had grown up in. It had become a bed and breakfast. They stopped, they had lunch. She told the owners why she was there. They gave her a tour of the house, the private part, and then he took her to the, she took her to the cemetery and saw all the gravestones. That was so moving for her mother it was moving for her to share that with her mother. And then when she came home, she told her cousin, uh, because the cousin's mother and, and her mother are sisters, and she relived that. And she, I said, you've got to include that in the book. That's very special. And you want to be a wonderful ancestor. That's why you're doing this. Wouldn't we love to have a book by our, even a scrap, no papers, by a relative, a, a, a family member, a grandparent, even if it wasn't in wonderful English, even if it wasn't polished in any way, just even thoughts, wouldn't we love to have it? Our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren are going to be thrilled to have these books. So these are all the reasons why you want to do it and to keep in mind while you're doing it. Okay, so we begin. Beginning any trip is with the first step. I want you to break this down into small steps so it's not overwhelming. Make it simple for yourself. There's no hard rules. You don't ever have to do this or have to do that. You pick up a book in the library, you're going to see there's a million books. There's a million different ways they were written. It cracks me up. Sometimes you see books, Robert Ludlum, this big, and then underneath the title. You have people who like Robert Ludlum don't even care what he wrote, or Stephen King. It's a new book by him, and they buy it. So sometimes it's a picture on the cover, sometimes there's not. Sometimes different parts of the book are organized differently. No hard rules. You can do whatever you want to do. Don't wait to have all the documents. You can start writing now and then all of a sudden realize, you know what? I don't have his death certificate or I don't have his naturalization paper. All right, you leave that chapter blank for a while or you put in some sketchy ideas and then you're going to come back to it. Now you realize what you're missing and you can look for it. And now that you know you can look it at the uh, library, you can continue on with Ancestry, or this is a great time to send, aw send away. I've sent away for three documents I realized I didn't have. I've heard from one already. So, you know, right away. Don't wait till you have all those documents. Say, well, I can't start because, no, 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 no. So here are the parts of the book. We're gonna break it up into a dedication, an introduction, and then the body, everything else that we're going to put into it. And at the end, we do an epilogue. Okay, that's pretty simple. I start with the dedication. When I, I'm a list making person, I wake up in the morning or sometimes the night before, I'm going to make a list of everything I need to do the next day. I always put something easy on the top. I don't want to put something on the top that's going to take me four hours to do, because then the other things on the list will may not get done. Put something easy on the top of the list. Psychologically, whew, I just did that, cross it off, now on to the next thing. So a dedication is really very quick and simple and easy to do. So the first page of the book, I say, write a dedication. Well, what do you write? Sometimes you're going to pick up and it says to my wife. Sometimes I'll say to my wife, Susan. But there are three places that you can dedicate this book, or people you can dedicate the book to. 
First is the person you're writing about. Dad, this is dedicated to you. I want my children and grandchildren to know the kind of person you were, okay? Um, you know, I knew you, they don't. So you can write it dedicated to the person you are writing about so that that person's life will be remembered. You live as long as you are remembered. Second one, you can dedicate it to your children and grandchildren. Hey, children and grandchildren, you never knew your grandfather very well. He died when you were young, whatever. And here is to bring his life um, so that you will understand it and know it and the hardships that he went through. So you can dedicate it to your children and your grandchildren or your grandchildren, whatever the situation. The other way you can go <clears throat> is um, to your spouse, significant other. You know, instead of doing something you were supposed to do, you're sitting at your computer. Well, they've been very patient with that. Or you've been on the phone for an hour with somebody instead of doing something they had asked. Thank them. Dedicate the book to them because they were so patient with you, you were able to get this done. Or the person who helped you write it. If you have a sibling or a cousin that says, oh, I want to help you do that, great. Thank them. So again, you can see there's no rules. You can go up to the person you're writing about. You can go down to the children and grandchildren. You can go sideways to a patient spouse or sideways to a person that helped you. Your choice. So you should say, all right, write two or three sentences. What I tell you to do is set up a folder in your computer, call it book or dad's book. And then each section is a separate page because otherwise they run onto each other and then you change something and it gets technically messy. So just call it dedication page, write something. Maybe halfway through the book, you decide, you know what, instead of your person, your uh, spouse, you want to dedicate to, and fine, you can change it because you haven't printed it out yet. So it's easy enough to change, but you have something. You can't edit nothing. You can edit something that's there. Okay. Did a dedication. Now we're going to do an introduction. I like people to put a little bit of an introduction. Why are you writing this book? Well, how did it come about? Well... We were in the middle of a pandemic and I had nothing to do. So I turned on this lecture by this crazy genealogy lady and she inspired me to do it. Okay. You can put, I've had people do that and they've included my name. You don't have to. You can say, I wanted to do it because um, it, it, it's something I wanted to do. How it came about. What was the inspiration for doing this? Or you've been doing genealogy for a long time. And some of you have entered all of this into family tree maker. Well, that's not a simple program that somebody's just going to pick up and click around and figure out right away unless they're really good at genealogy. So rather than make them do that, by putting it into a book form, it's easier for them to see. So you want to inspire your family then to click through that and find all that information for you. Okay. Why are you writing it? Because this person was special to you and they want to capture and you'd be surprised what you have in your brain. Even, you know, my father, he lived to 102. He never quite understood this. I was picking his brain about his mom and his dad. And I'm asking him questions. And finally, one day he said to me, well, if you, she wore a blue dress every day, would you want to know that too? And I said, absolutely. That puts a picture in my head of this woman wearing blue all the time because she had light eyes and it enhanced her eyes and whatever. Whatever scrap of information you have, is more than what your children have. So don't ignore even the small little bits of information and facts. That's why you're writing it, to put, bring that person's life forward. When you're doing it, you want to include the date and your signature. Again, that's personalizing it. Put your signature at the page some point um, and put a date. I would hope postpone putting the date until you know when you finish it or date started and then date completed. That would be fun too. So they can see this was a three month project or a year project, okay? All right, so we did the first two. That was the easy part, dedication, introduction. Now we're going to start the body of the book. What do you include in the body? I said all this is on outlines. Um, you want to do a little geography. Kids today do not learn geography. So if your family was from Dresden, Germany, for instance, or Erie, Ireland, uh, Erie, excuse me, um, County Cork, Ireland, do people know where that is? Is that east, west, north, south? Where is Dresden in the part of Germany? So you want to do a little geography. Put in a, a map, first of, of the big country, say Germany, uh, showing where Dresden is, and then do another map 
of just Dresden and show the area of Dresden that they lived. So give them a little bit of grounding in geography. You also want to write the history of the period. When this person was born in 1907 or whenever, what was the country like? If they were born in the United States, this does not have to be an immigrant book, obviously. If they were born in the United States, who was president of the United States when they were born? Who was the governor of the state? Maybe he was a famous governor, a famous mayor, include that. What was going on? What was the cost of um, items? You know, give us a history of that period. If they were born in the old country, who was the leader in the old country? What was going on? I sense, now we're not writing a history of the world. This is a one page history of the period, one page. You're going to certainly want to include all the documents have, births, marriage, deaths, military records, any kind of notes, any kind of letters that were written, whatever documents you have, you want to include that in the body of the book, always copies. The originals are kept home separately. You want to do charts and graphs. I'm a visual person, a chart very, if you say, well, he had this person, this person, this, and all in words, yes, that's important, but putting it into a chart, then I see all at once, here's the father, here's the mother, and then here's all the children, who they married, how many children they had, dates, whatever, nice and neat, and graphs. Those are very concise. People, I watch it, I, I've had different groups come in to my classrooms and we have the books out and they sit and they look at those charts because that's very interesting visually. And then of course, the all important stories, the stories that you know from your family. Yeah, be careful when I talk about how to talk about the stories, but the all important stories. You wanna make sure that they're somehow grounded or family law says. I had um, I used to do a webpage and I was writing about a cousin who was gonna be 70 years old. So her sister, her youngest sister writes me and says, oh, can I help you write the book? I said, sure, of course. And um, you know better than I did. And so she starts it off. It was a beautiful spring day in April when Rose was born. And I stopped right there and I picked up the phone and I called her, she was in Florida. And I said, how do you know it was a beautiful spring day? Oh, but it sounds so nice. Her head's always in the clouds. I said, you can't say that. Because if you say something like that without backing it up, everybody's going to say, how did she know that? And everything else after that is going to come into question. I said, it could have been a stormy, rainy, pouring day in April. It could have been an unusually hot day. It could have been a little snowflake. You have no idea what that day was like. So unless you get on the, website, uh, uh, the computer and look up the uh, weather, and you can do that. You might get the newspaper and find the weather. You can't say that. Or you can say, you know, you have to be careful what you say and how you present it. Family photographs. This is not a scrapbook. However, you don't want to be it heavy in words. I try to have at least um, a page every other word, a picture every other page or one per page. It keeps it light. People are going to look at the picture first. Oh, who is that? And you have the little caption and then you want to know about that. And then you read the story. So you don't want it heavy in text, lots of text is good, but then you want lots of pictures. So you're gonna add family photographs to it. Again, it's not a scrapbook. You want photographs from the period, and I'm gonna show you how to find those because you may not have a picture of your grandfather who was a barber. They didn't take pictures those days and certainly not of him working, but how do you fill that in? So I'll show you doing that. The also thing that I like to do is do a timeline. Start the year they were born, maybe the year they immigrated to the United States, the year they came, uh, they got married, a naturalization, et cetera. And I will show you, I'm showing you examples of all of this. You'll see it. But putting it in a timeline solidifies what was happening when in order. Keeps everything focused. Okay, so let's start from the beginning. A geography page. You want pictures of the town. I don't care what town they come in and how small it is in any place in the world. You Google the name of that town and you're going to find a web page for that town. I could almost guarantee it. And they're going to have pictures and they'll have populations and they'll have information on that town. Yay. That's what you want. There's going to be a description. What, what is this town like? It's a little town in Italy. It's, um, I'll use my family, uh, the Amalfi Coast. Okay. A little town called Minori. Is it a hilltop town? Is it a farming village? Is it industrial? Was there mining? What kind of town was it? What was it famous for? How did those people, most of those people, make their living? Sometimes you can even find, they'll have charts of population in various periods of time, and that's kind of cool. Um, town festivals. What was important for that town? 
were there particular celebrations that they enjoyed? Um, if you're a Catholic, that each little town had a famous saint. Was it chestnut picking time? Was it grape stomping time? Uh, whatever it was on that town, there had to be a festival. Maybe the, the festival of a famous person who lived in that town. May Day. How was it celebrated? Capture the feeling of that town. What was the population? What is it today? That's usually easy enough to find. But 1910, sometimes they have graphs, 1910, 1920, 1930, and tell you the population. If it isn't, you can sort of guess. It was a big industrial town. It was a small little farming village. You also want maps of the area. You start with a general map, like I said, of Germany, and then zero in and zero in. And then what were the major occupations? How did these people make a living? So here's a geography page on Licata. Probably never heard of it. It's a little town in Sicily. So I did a map, found a map on the internet, and I put a little, I have those little red dots that you've heard me talk about the colored dots. Here it is. So Sicily is a triangle. It's on the south side of the island. And I just go through, it was the birthplace of my maternal grandmother, okay? It's located into the 45 minutes from Agrigento, which is the bigger town. Uh, the population in 2004 was 38,000. Okay, then it goes on, it's 69 square miles. So give me a sense of size. It was a seaport, shipping asphalt, cheeses, and sofa. It was the largest European exporting center. And then you go down here for those products. Then the Arabs conquered it. Uh, goes on and on and on. Bourbon, the Giuseppe Garibaldi went through the town. It served as the Allied landing point during 1943, during World War II invasion of Sicily. So one page. You want to do two pages? Okay, you can do two pages. But keep in mind, you're writing about a person and not about a town. So the highlights of the town, the kind of person that it, the kind of town that it was, what it was famous for. I've been to the town, so I have pictures. If you can find the town hall, schools, maybe a main street, an important street, important buildings. Give me an idea of the arch um, architecture, okay? So that's a fun page to do. So one class time for the two hours, we will sit in class and we will work on the research of the particular town. And then later on, uh, we can figure out how to do wrapping around the fonts, the, around the pictures and making it look really nice, okay? So that's a geography page, one page, maybe two. Don't get carried away, although it does get so interesting. You fall into these deep holes and it's just very exciting. Okay, I told you we wanted to talk about a history of the period when your person was born. Google the year of birth or immigration. If he, if he was born in 1875, maybe you prefer, or 1893, maybe you prefer to use the year he immigrated into the United States. Whatever you want. You can do both if you really want, but you can just type in, go into Google and type 1906, and you'll get everything that happened in 1906. Uh, world events, who was born, who died, uh, whatever was going on, who was ruling the different countries at that time. So you get a sense of when the person was died in 1907 in uh, whatever town, New Canaan, what was it like? Who was in charge? Okay. You want to include historical events of that period. 19, oh, my father was born in 1912, okay? Sinking the Titanic comes right off the top of your head. What else was going on in that town? For my grandfather, I put in um, a newspaper that may have just started being printing, or the L uh, was just the first L was being built, or trolleys were just phasing in or phasing out. Whatever it is, whatever was going on, not only national history, but of the town. Was there a major flood? You know, in Texas, there was a huge flood the year one of my students' parents were born. So you put that in there because that would affect the whole town. Was there a hurricane, whatever, okay? That's important. Historical events, like I said, not only necessarily national, but local, a flood, a hurricane, whatever. Include, it's fun to do the people that born and died that year. I'll show you when I did my father's page, the year that the people that were born that year he was born, he outlived every single one of them. That's kind of fun. And see who died that year. Just important people that if you're German or Irish, you maybe want to put a heavier emphasis on the Irishmen that died or the Germans, you know, whatever. 
You also, the cost of common articles, what did a house cost? What did a stamp cost? What did a gallon of milk cost? A gallon of gas? It's fun to see what these numbers look like. Who was the president of the United States? Who was your governor? Who was the leader of the mother country? Who was the Pope if you're Catholic? Who, who was running the area that that person was living in? And then I like to include popular songs, movies, inventions. The sometimes bookstores will have the year in review. It'll be a year 1943 or 1923. I've bought year books for my children, two each for them, one for them and one for me. The year that I was born, my cousins, I give them as gifts for people. So popular songs, movies, inventions. It's a fun, fun Tony, thing. Do you have yes. time for do you have time for a question? Sure, of course. Okay, so Susan is asking, what are your thoughts about including sad or negative information? She is doing research on, about the family of a Civil War soldier, but she's discovering a long history of alcoholism in both the soldier, the children, the grandchildren, and there are current family members that may be struggling with this. So what's your position on that? Absolutely. Excellent, excellent question. I usually cover it later on, but I'll be happy to do it now. Don't, don't skirt those issues. If they exist, especially alcoholism, we know alcoholism is, be, is, a, is a tendency, it's a disease. And people have a tendency in certain families genetically to do that. So if you know, I've got a cousin whose father and grandfather died of alcoholism. And I gently let her know that because she's got sons and she's got grandchildren. So you want to watch that. So you want to make sure that if there is a disease, there's something that's going on in the family, you don't ignore it. Let people know that gently. I had a woman who was very upset that she had seen her grandmother had been abused by the husband and then left with her children. And she says, do I put that in? And I said to her, yes. Let your grandchildren know that they may be struggling with issues now. They're not the first person to struggle with them. And here is a woman who is totally uneducated, had all these children. Her husband leaves her. She has no way to support them. And she's recovered and she survived and she became stronger. So that's an encouragement for people to say, yes, people face difficulties and look how they handle them. Maybe some didn't do so well. You know, some of them may become a, a, an alcoholic and, and die. Okay, well, you got to know that. Some of them overcame certain family issues and did better. The only time I would say be very careful, when I was doing a book on my aunt and my uncle, um, I had spoken to one of her, her sister, and they were both alcohol. He used to like to drink at night, and when he drank, he got violent. He used to hit her. He used to beat her. This one picture of her, she looks like she's all black eyes. Um, I did not put that in the book because the children were all alive and I was not aware. I know the youngest two did not know it and I wasn't going to be the one to have them to read it in a book. So I did leave that out. I did mention to one of the older sisters who knew it. I said, you know, you know, it's up to you to tell them if the person is alive or the direct descendant is alive, then you got to be a little bit more careful with that, a little bit more gentle. But if there's been an issue in your family, Yes, people should know that and they should know that they overcame it. Or this is what it was. Hey, you know, sometimes babies were born before people got married. Okay, that happened. You know, uh, now today it's not as big a deal, but, but then it was. And there was tremendous shame on that. So don't skirt those issues. Include them gently, but definitely include them. So good question. I hope it answered. If you got more follow-up, I will be happy to answer. So here's the year 1912. So this was the year my dad was born. So who was the president of the United States? Who was the Pope? Who was the head of Italy? Who was the king of Italy? All right. Then I listed all the people born in 1912. Elvis Presley's mother, Lady Bird Johnson, uh, Jay Silverheels, Dale and Roy Rogers, you know, just people. Okay. Julia Child. He outlived all of them. He lived to 102, almost three weeks short of 103. Then miscellaneous facts. The postal rate was one cent, so or two cents rather. So um, I found a picture on the Internet, so you put it in. Titanic sank, that was a big thing. Life expectancy in 1912 was 51.9 years, 52. My father doubled that, okay? Uh, the 1930 census, because I did this before the census of 40 came out. Did they own uh, a radio? The Prince Macaroni Company was founded on Prince Street in Boston. How fun is that? 
popular songs, Waiting for the Robert E. Lee, Old Gang of Mine, etc., Sweetheart of Sigma Chi. And then some prices, the cost of a house, car, uh, cost of bread. Gallon of gas was 11 cents. A gallon of milk was 33, three times. So if we're roughly paying $3 a gallon for gas, that would be $9 for a gallon of milk today. That's why children didn't drink milk then. It was very expensive. So this is kind of fun. This is kind of fun to see um, what things cost. All right. So now, what kinds of topics are we going to include in our book? Well, we're going to start from the very beginning. So we did a geography page, got that done. We've got a year page, the other person was born, that's done. Now we start on the person's life, birth and early childhood. Well, I wasn't around when my grandfather was born. How am I going to write about that? It's not that difficult. Pull out information from the birth certificate. Was he the first child? Was he the fifth child? Was he the first boy after seven girls? Um, was he the first of six boys? Who knows? Write that down. Pull that all out. His father was the, how old was the father? How old was the mother when that child was born? What were their occupations? Where were they living? Typical of the time the boy grew up in a household, yada, yada, yada. Typical of the time he became a shoemaker like his father or a baker like his father. You can fill in. I wrote a whole page on the birth of my grandfather and I wasn't there. Okay. So you can pull that out. Some of my students are very, very good at researching and then it's pulling teeth to get them to sit down and finally write it. Others, I've got one student, oh my God, she's written four books. You could cry the way she writes. It's so beautiful. And her stories are sometimes are so funny. She had a more a harder time doing the computer part and formatting it. Others love the formatting, but they don't like to write. So everybody has a forte. So you're going to be stretched. You're going to be stretched. You're going to grow. And that's a good thing. Okay. Then what was it like as a young adult? Like I said, and I'll show you pictures that we're going to do um, as a young adult. He, you know, kids didn't have the liberty to go to college and not grow up until they're 22. These were young adults at 14 and 15 and maybe helping the father taking care of the business or the older daughters helping take care of the younger ones. What was that like? How long did they go to school? Girls, did she finish elementary school? Boy, did he finish elementary school? Did he finish high school? Those are the kinds of things that you want to put in. Marriage and honeymoon. How did these two young people meet? Well, you probably may not know that unless it's a family story, but look at where they were living at the time. Did they live a block away from each other? Were both fathers in the same business? Were they both bakers and their families knew each other and that's how their children met? Do you know where your honey did, went on their honeymoon? That's another one. I was talking with my aunt one day and we were having lunch at a particular restaurant. She says, oh, you know, my mom and dad had their reception here. It was uh, in Brooklyn. And I go, oh, wow. Okay. So you never know what you're going to find. And you may not be able to find this, but do the best you can. Do the best you can. A military career. Were they the right age to serve in the military? If they did, do you have a draft card registration? Do you have any military documents? Do you have any muster rolls? Um, did he win any awards or medals? Was he serving in what wars, in what units? Does he know the division was a cavalry, was it Air Force? Whatever it was, whatever you have as a military career, that's a great page to work on. That can be more than one page. That can be two or three. Include the person's personality. Was he a big man? Was he a small man? Was he skinny, skinny? Was he rotund? Um, did he laugh very quickly? Was he very stern? Was he affectionate? Lots of grandparents did not show affection to their children or grandchildren. You would never see them hug them. Um, I had an uncle who used to sneak quarters to us every time he came to visit. What was his personality like? Did he use a spittoon? Did he smoke a smelly cigar? What was his personality like? Whatever you have, whatever little bits of information, and you think you don't know it, and you start to write, and it starts to come back. You'd be surprised when you start writing how thoughts come back. So the other thing I do is keep a pencil and a paper by my night table at night. And then in the middle of the night when you have it, oh, I remember that grandpa always used to do this. Good. Write it down. Write it down. What sport did he, probably didn't play sports like tennis the way we do today, but did he like to read the newspapers? Did he collect stamps? Did he collect postcards? Whatever it was. 
the all important family stories, whatever stories that you can remember, you want to write down. Always say the family story was. You can't present them as fact unless you have proof. Doesn't mean they're not true. They may have been uh, twisted a little, they may have been exaggerated a little bit, but those are the family stories. So include them. You know, the stories that we used to tell at the dinner table that we couldn't wait to go away. Mom, I'm finished. May I leave the table? Those stories that we didn't listen to. Talk about his work or occupation. Was it a work and occupation that his father and grandfather had done and he followed in the same business? Did he love his work? Did he hate it? What was it? What did he do? And then, of course, at the very end, his death and burial. Where did he die? What did he die of? How old he is? Where was he buried? And whatever information you have. So these are all the topics. So you're going to take one of them. Sometimes you're going to wake up in the morning. I'm a morning person. I was saying this morning, I'm a morning person. So I get up at, at 6.30 to 7. I do compute my um, emails. And then 7 o'clock, I write until 9. I'm always writing a new lecture, a new presentation. That's my fresh time. So sometimes you just wake up in the morning, you feel like writing, write. Sometimes it, nah, I don't want to do it. Let me just do some research because I enjoy that. Whatever, whatever. This is supposed to be a fun adventure. And we're home now. We have a little bit more time than we normally would. We should take advantage of it. Okay. So now that we've done the topics, now let's talk about the type of documents to put in. Okay. Um, you're certainly going to start off with a birth, baptismal certificate, whatever you have. If you've got both, you put them both in. If you don't realize, oh gosh, I don't have a birth certificate, take the time, right away for it. All right, that gives you a lot of information. Don't say, I know when he was born. No, you want that document because on there it will give you information you may not have had. A marriage certificate, very important. It's got witnesses on there. Oh, I didn't know Uncle George was the witness for my father's wedding or my grandfather's wedding? Or who is this person that witnessed it for the woman? Was it a cousin? Was it a neighbor? You want that marriage certificate. <clears throat> Both the federal, I mean the state, and the religious one. If they were an immigrant, you want, certainly want that immigrant manifest. If you're lucky enough to have a copy of the passport, you want that passport. Military documents. Whatever military documents that you have or can send away for, include in the book. Of course, census records. You know, if you've ever heard any of my lectures, the first thing you do is start with census records. It tells you wonderful stories about that people and that family and how it came about. So you want all the census records, include them all. You want letters. Do you have letters? I mean, I'm getting, I just got a letter yesterday from somebody who went through a box and she's finding all kinds of letters and wonderful stuff. and. Uh, love letters between the two parents, a little bit of a spat, and then stuff that she didn't know was going on. Um, sad stuff in her family. So use those letters. If they were naturalized, the naturalization papers, whatever documents you can find, whatever you can put your hands on. And then of course, a death certificate. With that, our bits, funeral cards, newspaper notices. If you can, now you've got newspapers.com, you've got genealogy bank, um, New York Times, if you can find a newspaper article of their death, a funeral card, obit, whatever you can find. All right. So these are the type of documents. I know this sounds like a lot. I'm going through, I'm going to say now of all the things you should do, you do them one at a time, nice and slowly. With your documents, you're a genealogist, if you are, and you know how difficult some of those census or immigration records can be. Put the information that the census certificate is saying, in two words on the bottom, and I will show you, on the bottom of that certificate, it says here that yada, 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 yada. So people are going to read that. And they say, wow, where does it say that? Now they're willing to look at the document because, you know, some of these certificates are so difficult to read. Talk about the crossing of the Atlantic and the process at Ellis Island. Again, not a book on it. Just what was it like? What was it like crossing over? It wasn't the QE2. Uh, the kinds of conditions, the food, the bathrooms, the seasicknesses, and then going through Ellis Island. Two pages, maybe. All right. And then if they were naturalized, you want to explain the naturalization process. When we're doing this page in class, I will review with everybody that they had to be in the States for two years. They applied for the, the first papers, their declaration of intent, three more years, their petition. They had to go to court. They had to bring witnesses. Go through that. Let these people know, let your relatives know what it was like to become a citizen of the United States. Again, you're not writing the whole history of naturalization. 
but what that person would have going through, what he must have felt. So here's an example. This is the birth certificate. By the way, if you have a Q&A, just put it in a question, go up to the top, type in your Q&A, and then I will check every once in a while to see if there are questions. So this is the birth certificate of my grandfather. It's all in Italian. Nobody's going to be able to read that, or a few people. So what I did was I underlined, not on the original, but I underlined the, the names, the dates, the occupations of the important people. This is the mother, trophy name of Landa. Landy, they were born the street. This is the name of the street, the son of, whatever. And then on the bottom, my grandfather, great-grandfather's signature. That says something at this point that he was able to... Um, uh, in 1872, he'll be able to sign his name and he signed it beautifully. And then here it tells me that this is Gaetano's birth certificate. It's my grandfather. Registered in the town. It indicates that the great grandfather was a pasta maker. Um, he was the father of so and so and so and so, et cetera. Street, the street of the fountain is where they were born. And then the date of the registration. Note Giuseppe's signature at the bottom of the page. So now it's telling you what it says, and then you can look for the words. And even if it's in English, sometimes it's still very difficult to say, to say, to read. Here is a t the census. So the 1920 census gives all the information. Here's the census. I got lucky. It was right on the top of the page. So I pulled that out. Here is what the census looks like. Here is what it says. And then if you don't, again, we, we learn a lot of computer skills while we're doing this. If you're not familiar with Google Maps, you can go to Google Maps. You can type in East 5th Street and um, you can see the picture. Now, was the house when he was, it was a two family house. It still is. Was it red when he was living there? No way of knowing, but it doesn't matter. This is the house that it looked like. It gives you a sense of what the house looked like. So if you have a picture of the house, include it. Include it by all means. And you don't have to drive all the way into Brooklyn or somewhere in Ohio to find that picture. You can find it on the internet, Google Maps. Immigrations, oh my gosh, hard to read. So I put a dot at the beginning and the end of the line. Now nobody who's not a genealogist is gonna struggle this and try to figure out what this says. However, on the bottom in words, it says it's the second crossing of this person when he came in, who he was going to see, what his occupation was, etc. And he's going to see his brother-in-law, all right, who lived at 40 Union Street. Yay, he came in in 1890, so the 1900 census, I should be able to look on Union Street to see if I can find the family. So, <coughs> excuse me, always at the bottom of the page, put in words what's going on in that page, because people can't read it. Then once they read, they say, wow, how did he know he was a sailor? And I can look and I can see sailor right there. Okay? Any questions? Feel free. Naturalization documents include the story, how it comes about, explain the process, include as many documents as you can find. If you're lucky enough <coughs> to have this one, this is the only one that exists. Naturalization documents were done in triplicate. They, one went to the federal government, one went to the court in which it occurred, one was given to the actual person applying. This is the original. They didn't keep it. This is like a high school diploma. You have a high school diploma, all it says is your name, the year you graduated, and the name of the school. It doesn't tell you your grades of, and which courses you took. You have no idea. The school does not keep a copy of your diploma. They keep a copy of your grades. So that's what this is. Behind this, there are other documents. So if you're lucky enough to have this, you know the person was naturalized, you need to look for the other documents, okay? Now, ideas for photographs. Like I said, this is not a scrapbook, but we want to include pictures. So how do we go about doing that? Again, the internet to me is a dark hole. You could spend 23 out of 24 hours on the internet very easily. You want to find photos of the churches, the synagogue, where they were married, baptized, headstones, whatever you can find, and that's all online. You can photograph of the homes they lived in. I just showed you that the whole street, the hometown, get a feeling for what that town was like where they were living. Include pictures of the school, workplace. Be surprised what you can find. Photos of family, interests, hobbies, and I'm gonna show you all of that. 
And when you do that, you want to identify the people and the date and the place. One of my students had a wonderful picture of her father. He was sitting in a room. He's got a pipe in his hand, books behind him and bookshelves. And I, she just said, dad, 19, whatever. I said, where was he? Oh, do you know where he was? Oh yeah, he was a house on such and such a street. I said, include that. What kind of a room was this in? Oh, well, this was his little stead, his study, his den. Okay, say that. Was it on the first floor or the second floor? She told me that. In the picture, there was a, in the picture, there was a picture of a lamp and a, a, a picture. I said, do you anything know about that? Yeah, that picture was given to him as a wedding gift or that lamp was given to him as, you know, whatever. Good, include that. Make a whole story of that picture. Put him in a place. It's not just dad. It's dad sitting in his favorite room, smoking his pipe. I used to love the smell of it. It was up in his den. He used to love to sit up there and read whatever. Make a story on that. There's lots that you can pull out. So pictures, of course, if you have a woman that's very important, she wants her in a wedding day, you can include her with her parents on her wedding day. This is one of my cousins. My God, she has an encyclopedia memory. Um, and she was so close to her dad. I mean, they always were very, very close. That was important to her. So I included not just her husband and her, not her only and her children, but her and her dad, because that was so close to each other. Put a signature. If you've got a signature on any kind of a document, uh, maybe it's a purchase of something, maybe it's a military record, whatever, pull that out. So this is my grandfather and this is his signature. He was a very confident man. It says a lot about him. And even if your grandfather was struggling to put his name or there's an X between the first name and the last name, that means he couldn't sign his name. And sometimes there'll be a first name, an X and a last name. And you know that was his mark. Or sometimes underneath it will say his mark because he made the X saying, yes, this is your name. And he would sign it. Again, that tells you something about the person. Don't be ashamed of the fact that he didn't have a degree or he couldn't write his name. Typical of the time clothing. How many of you have pictures of wedding gowns, women with wedding gowns and for bouquets, it looks like they picked every single flower in their garden and the next door neighbors. Okay. What about Aunt Mary who always used, wore these huge big old hats or Aunt Jane with her famous hats? Famous heirloom, a piece of jewelry that maybe you still have that would be wonderful to take a picture of. How about your grandmother or your mother when they were little girls with a fancy, look at this, fancy, fancy lace or the jewelry. It tells you about the person. Or, I don't know if you can see this, if this is in the way. My grandfather was a designer. He made his own clothes. So he made his clothes and his wife's and his daughter's. So there they are. They're up in the country and they're all dressed. Tells you a story. Tells you a story. Holmes. I showed you the picture of my grandfather's house. I have on my, my son-in-law's German side, they were brought up in West Virginia. It's a picture of the house. And you can see the little design here. That's from um, Google Maps. I'm not driving to West Virginia. First of all, one of the things you can do when you go there and you put in an address, you can see if the house is still standing there. I mean, they may have torn this down and put up huge, uh, ugly, complex, or they may put a road through it or a highway through it. But if the house is still there, capture that. Because in two or three years, that may not still be there. Or they may tear this down house and build a mech mansion. So you want to get that house in. And of course, you want to identify it as to the street and location. So those are homes. How about the hometown? Again, get on the internet, type in your hometown and capture it. Does it have a cute little main street? What about the library? What about the church or house of, of worship that they may have attended? What about a school? Give you a sense. Ridgefield, we would do the, the clock tower. Maybe we do the water fountain, um, the Cass Gilbert fountain, whatever. What is typical? What is typical of New Canaan that you think about? So capture those pictures. Again, you can, if it's a nice day, you want to get out and do some exercise, you can take your own pictures or you get on the, on the internet, type in New Canaan and all kinds of pictures will come up and events, celebrations. You know, you have holidays, you have celebrations. Capture the town, get a sense of that town. Even if today it looks a little bit different, at least you still get a sense of it, okay? Working. Again, we don't have pictures of our grandfathers at work, but there are wonderful ads and telephone books. These are about push carts. If your grandfather earned a living with a push cart, either selling uh, rags, used clothing, apples, meat, produce, whatever. There are, there are ads for that. 
Well, they came from a farm area. And the farms are cooking. Here, my father was a dentist. So I took, a, I have his yearbooks, but in the back of one of his dental books was an ad. Remember, I mean, this brings back a pictures of when nurses used to wear white uniforms and white stockings and white shoes with their white, white caps. You could tell you what school they graduated from. This is all new modern equipment. Brings back memories of your childhood. This is the year that my father was going into medical, a dental um, practice. So it gives me a picture. Do I have a picture of him doing this? Of course not, but it's the next best thing. So you can find that. How about if he was this? How about he was a barber? Put in barber shop 1890. Look at the men wearing three piece suits with ties ready to cut your, your, you know, your father's or, or the client's hair or give him a shave but how nicely they used to dress in the velvet chairs. That was so beautiful. Or if he was a shoemaker, this area is probably smaller than several people's walk-in closets in their master bedrooms. And yet he was earning his whole life and his whole way of living on a space that was so confined, but he had his machines, he had his tools, he had his leather, he had his supplies, and he's working making shoes. Is that your grandfather making shoes? No. But does it give your grandchildren an idea of what it was like to be a shoemaker? You can be darn sure that it does. And that's the important thing. Pictures tell you so much about um, that we take for granted that we know about that our children don't. Like I said, this is smaller than maybe some of our closets. Hobbies. What kind of things do they do? One of my uncles, my uncles loved Loved, loved to go swimming. And every Sunday he would take the family to go to Coney Island and look at that sexy bathing suit on her and him, huh? And they would go swimming. Or maybe he was into baseball and there's all kinds of baseball cards. Maybe they love fishing and there's a picture of him as a young boy fishing or his grandson fishing. You can say he loved to take his grandson fishing. Picture the grandson. Um, your grandma, did she love to sew? Those old singer sewing machines. Get a picture of that. Did they play the piano? I have, still have my book from first grade, Teaching Little Fingers How to Play. In fact, when my grandchildren started to play the piano, I bought a new one. I didn't want them to use mine because it was so old. Not that I'm old, of course, but you know, this brings back memories. This is fun. People love to look at pictures like that. Oh yeah, I remember taking piano lessons. I remember my mother had a sewing machine like that. It gets them into the thing. How about toys? They didn't have computers in their hand 24 seven. No, but they had wooden rocking horses that they thought was so cute. And their dolls didn't talk and walk and move and animate and answer you back. This doll didn't even close her eyes. These little porcelain dolls, see the toys we play with. And what were they doing? They were playing in the street with a piece of stick for a bat and a ball. And maybe they broke a window or two or in a car and they were outside playing. Or of course the little the little wagons, so it gives you an idea of what their childhood was like. These are not the toys of your grandparents. These are not the, probably didn't have toys. These are not the toys of your father, but he or your mother. But she may have had a little wagon. So you can say these are the types of toys that children played with in the 1940s or 50s. So it gives them a visual. All right, education. Did they go to school in a one room schoolhouse out in the country somewhere? Or did they go to a big brick building? Lots of these in Brooklyn have these big brick buildings. Put it in, you know, give you an idea. Even if you can't find the schoolhouse that your grandfather or father went to, if you know it's a little schoolhouse, this one is Ridgefield or Reading. I think this is Reading. Um, you can get a picture, you type in one room schoolhouses and you'll get a million of them. Pick one and you say, this is similar to the school that my father or grandfather went to. If you're lucky enough to have the yearbooks, which I do, I could pull him out. This is his high school college yearbook where I pulled out his picture and some of the activities that he was involved in. So that's really cool when I was doing my father's book. Let me just see if there's any questions. No questions? Okay. Uh, military service. What branch of the service was he in? Army, Navy, sometimes cavalry? Draft card registrations. You know, people say, oh no, I wouldn't have a draft card. My, my father didn't serve. It's not, 
It's not whether he served or not. He still had to fill out a draft registration card. They all had to fill out draft registration cards. If he was old enough in the right ages, did he have, do you have any enlistment documents for him? If not, right away and send them. The Freedom of Information Act, I have to send them to you. Did he earn any medals? Where does you have his discharge papers? Right away for them, they'll send them to you. So you can see, I put in a poster. So you don't have any original documents from your family? Okay. Did he serve in the US Army? Put a poster in. This is the, they were trying to encourage young men to sign up. Look, here, follow me, put the poster in. Did he win a medal? How about my father was in the Army Air Corps? I found a patch, picture of him actually in the Army Air Corps. If you're lucky enough to have a dog tag, put it in. If you don't and you have, you can put in a dog tag from the internet and say, this isn't of course mine, but I know my father or grandfather had a dog tag. This is what we're talking about when we're saying a dog tag so that you know it, you know? Don't take for granted the kids, no, because they don't. Always write to the person who maybe you think is the least knowledgeable and you're going to have that, okay? Transportation, we could go on forever. Was he in the city? So if he was in the city, would he have gone with a trolley? Do kids today know what a trolley car is with the wires across, the, running along the streets? Of course not. Show him a picture of a trolley. Or was he one of the lucky ones that owned a car, one of the first cars that came out? Or was it earlier than that and it was a horse and buggy? We live in Boston and, and it was early and they were doing horse and buggy before the king car came on. Or were they up in the country? This is actually my grandfather's his G Anastasio. This was his wagon. And all the little kids were piled in there. And that was a fun thing. I don't know where I got that one from. Um, obviously, it's in my family. So what were they, how were they getting around? Basically, how were they getting around? What mode of transportation? Puts a picture in somebody's mind. What was their daily life like? Remember Woolworths? My goodness, where stuff was like 30 cents for a, a ice cream soda or a sandwich was 30 cents, 50 cents for a bacon and tomato sandwich. Bacon and ham and cheese was 60 cents. Advertisements, how they used to advertise cigarettes. The old phones. Hi, Mabel, this is Tony. Mabel will be the operator. Can please, you can connect me to my uh, Aunt Sue. And of course, there'd be party lines and people could listen in. Put that in there. That is so cool. You think the kids, I, I, I don't know if you guys have seen it. There is a video on the internet where a father gives his two sons with the hats on backwards an old dial telephone and gives them a phone number and says, dial this phone number. It is the funniest thing you have ever seen. I still may have it. If you want it, write to me and I will see if I can find it. They could not figure out how to dial a telephone. Like I said, we take things for granted. If your father or grandfather was a grocer, again, you're not going to find a picture of him, maybe. But here's a picture of a grocery store. If you're really good at Photoshop, we could take this little head out and we could put your grandfather's head on there. And I've been known to do that. Um, and you can say this picture was doctored, whatever. But here's a little grocery store. This is what it looked like. It wasn't these stupid, these new huge super... Uh, stop and shops or the big shopping stores that people go. Whole Foods, my goodness. Whole Foods couldn't even contain their vegetable department in this small store. So you get an idea of what it was like for them to have a little grocery store and what it looked like. Again, go online, put grocery store in 1910. You'll find pictures. Okay. For the moms, how many mothers and grandmothers wore aprons? I still wear an apron when I'm in the kitchen because I wear my clothes very well. Um, so aprons hanging on the line and you always remember your grandma's house, she always had her apron on. Um, sitting around watching the radio. This was a big entertainment for the family, sitting around listening to Superman or um, the Phantom Nose. I mean, these wonderful stories. What was laundry day like? The old wooden wash bin with the scrubbing board. And then they wring out the clothes, which was quite the new invention at the time, and then having to iron everything. Now when we throw everything in the washing machine and some generations today, the kids don't even own irons. My grand, both my daughter and granddaughter, I don't think own an iron. It scares me. Card catalog. 
You don't look everything on the computer. The whole world isn't on computer the way the kids see it is today. We have to look card catalog and look up the little cards. Remember the hole and the little uh, metal rod that went through them? That's how we went to get the library books. Find out what was there, what was there, okay? Picture pages. This is not a scrapbook. However, I put together what I, a picture page. So I put my, instead of just a title with words, I put my grandfather's signature on the top. What was he most interested in? He loved, as you saw this picture of clothing. So I have a picture of him with him, his daughter and his wife in the clothes that he made for them. He was a huge fanatic about cars. He always liked the newest car. So I say that. Um, did I know what kind of car this was or even this one? No clue. However, there's always somebody that knows something. The nuns in school used to say, you don't have to know everything. You have to know people who do. One of my students, husband was a car enthusiast. He knew everything about cars. And I knew my grandmother died in 1938. So this had to be, be before 1938. But I brought him this picture and he could pretty well, he said it was probably taken between 35 and 38. That's what we're getting by the car. And you could, he would, he would known people above this one was a Packard or Cadillac. So the man could tell me what kind of car it was and approximately the year. So I'll put that in. This is what my grandfather was all about. This is what my grandmother was. We want to remember your grandmother being in the house with a little floral house dress with the apron, cooking and cleaning and washing and ironing and sewing. Put a picture together. Put a picture together. Okay, the all important stories. Include the physical description. What did the person look like? Again, was he tall? Was he short? Was he heavy? Was he skinny? Um, did he laugh quickly? Did he use a spittoon? Did he smoke a smelly cigar? This is all included in his personality. What did he like? What did his dislike? I said they didn't have hobbies the way we do today, playing tennis or golf. But he might have liked to have gone fishing. He might like to sit in his room and read. Maybe he liked to read you the funny papers. Whatever they liked, if you can find it, put that in, put that in. Education or lack of it and his occupation. Did he finish the fourth grade? Did he go finish high school? Was he the first one in his family to finish high school? Where did he go to high school? And then what would he do as an occupation? What were family gatherings and holidays like? Were they big feasts? Were all the grandmothers and aunts and uncles and cousins all there? Holidays were big, big feasts. Was everybody sitting around eating? Did they give you a little bit of wine in a thick glass, a jelly glass, a little bit of club soda in it? Put that in. Those are wonderful stories to remember. The reason I'd like you to put it into a loose leaf book, and when we finish our talk to you about that, you want it in a loose leaf book, is because then you can always add pages. If you have a chapter that you found you've got new information for or corrected information, you just have to change that one page instead of throwing out the book and redoing it. So that's really very nice. Um, so I had finished writing the book of my grandfather. And then one day I went inside to sit and play the piano. I thought, oh my gosh, we had a piano. We had a piano. So I sat and enrolled all about the player piano that we had. And I could add the page, I could just tuck it in because it's a loose leaf book, okay? And you can see how I wrapped the picture around the text and it kind of goes there nicely, kind of cool. Okay, so those are stories. Now, how about you? Maybe you feel, I, I, I don't want to write today. I just don't, I'm not in the mood. I really don't feel like researching. How about, or the internet's down? Let's do a chart, okay? You want a couple of charts. You want an ancestor. Start with your father, your grandfather, and go back. Where did he come from? You want to say, what was his descendants? Okay, he and his wife. What were their children? Who were their children? When did they get married? Who did they marry? List of siblings. He didn't grow up in an island. He probably wasn't an only child, although it certainly could have been. But he had siblings, okay? Put him in contact with his family. List his own children. List his own children, okay? List his residence. If he moved around a lot, he started in Manhattan on, I don't know, Broom Street. And then he went to the Bronx and lived on Tremont Avenue. Or from New York, he moved out to Queens, which was the country, and then decided to get more country and moved to Connecticut. Or he started in Hartford and he wound up in New Canaan. List those residents if he moved around a lot. That's kind of fun to watch and see. Remember, though, this is about one 
person because you see all the information we have. If you start writing about all the aunts and the uncles and the brothers and the sisters, you're going to lose it. It just, it will be a, an encyclopedia of 27 volumes. So here's an ancestor chart. All of this, if you put the information on Family Tree Maker, you know I don't like you putting it on Ancestry. It becomes out there for the whole world. But if you put it on an ancestor chart in Family Tree Maker, here's my grandmother. So here's her father and their side and her mother and that side. One page. One page. You can put in a birth, a death, and location. Okay? Boom. Simple. Ancestor charts. You know who came before them. Then my grand, so if I'm doing my grandfather, Gaetano, he was not an only child. So here's Giuseppe and Trofimena. Don't you love those names? Those are my great grandparents. And these are the children they had. They had eight children. Three of them died very young. I have a birth and a death. End of story. Here's my grandfather. This is the whole book. That's four. The other four, the other four children, I did a paragraph on each one. I fitted on one page. Again, this isn't about all the other brothers and sisters of my grandfather. Just a bit of sentences about each one of my grandfather's brothers and sisters because he didn't grow up on an island. He had family and these are the family. Then I can pull out if I want one of these family members and do another whole book on them. But right now we're focusing on the grandfather. Keep it simple. Okay. Then my grandfather had children. He married my grandmother. They had 12 children. And you can see when I did this, both of these now last two are dead. Um, so I just made a chart. You can make a chart of whatever you want. I included a birth, the name of the spouse, the marriage date, the number of children, and the date they died. That's what I chose to include. You could put in whatever else you want. But this I felt was the most important, the birth and death of the person, birth, marriage, and death. Well, marriage, who they marry here, who they married, the number of children. You can see these huge families. Again, with this one, I did one sentence about each of the children. That I mean, these children died very young, those three, so I didn't know. So nine children. So nine sentences, nine. I'm starting to do a book now on Joseph because he was World War II veteran. I have stuff on him, okay? Um, but one sentence about each one of these children. Don't make it so overwhelming that you just say, I can't do this. It's too much. It's not. It's not too much if you stay focused. It's not too much if you stay on one person. And do little bits at a time. Maybe one day you're going to sit down and you'll work on this for four hours. And maybe another time, a half an hour, and I'm done. Whatever. Whatever. Doesn't matter. There's no deadline. You don't have a publisher that's pushing you to have a deadline. This is a process. Okay. Maps of the area. You want to include residences, work, church, whatever. This was kind of fun. When I did this map of my grandfather, my mother's side of the family, they all lived, worked, and got married in one place. Here's where they got married. These two green dots are where they were living um, and their businesses, where they were working. So this is very, I think, very, very interesting. They all lived on top of each other, very, very close. And it's a Brooklyn Navy Yard. You can see here's the Navy Yard. So you can see where they include a major street. This is Hicks Street. This is Atlantic Avenue. This is South Brooklyn. So he had his designing school. This is where he worked. One, two, three, four, five, six blocks down. They could have walked. This is where they got married. This is where he was living and where she was living. Very similar. Gives you a picture of it. And now I know where they were living. Okay. Timelines are really great to do. The highlight, the events in this person's life in chronological order on a chart naturally. So this is one of my cousins who I never met. Don't tell me you can't write about your grandfather because you certainly knew him. You certainly knew him, even only for a couple of years. These people I never met. They died when I was a little girl. But it shows you he was born first in the old country, and then she was born. Then she came to the United States. He came to the United States. He declared his intent to become a citizen. Before he became a naturalized citizen, he married his wife. During that time, a year later, he... Um, had registered for the draft registration. So I have his draft registration card. Then he petitioned for naturalization. He became a naturalized citizen that was approved in 1920, 1930. Again, um, I had done this. I need to see now I've got one page 
but I need to update this. Why? I don't have them in the 1940. This was done before the 1940 came out. So I'm looking at this now and said, all right, it's easy enough to do. If you're familiar with um, making charts and graphs, I can just insert another line and show where they were both living in the 1940 census. And then he died and eight months later, she died. Nice, neat. You may want to put this in the very front of your book so you can see where you're going to be going with it. Again, there's no rules. You can put it in the back with the chart. I don't like to put all the charts and graphs in the back. I like to mix them up. When you're talking about him being born, put the ancestor tree in the front. After he gets married, put in your chart of the children that he has. If you put them all in the back, people are going to say, oh, I don't want to look at the charts. So interdisperse the charts with the timelines, with the picture pages throughout the book. Don't say we're going to put all the charts together. People will tend to look at them. Okay. <clears throat> with my aunt and uncle, who I never knew, or with maybe your grandfather, maybe you have older aunts and cousins, hopefully, or cousins that remember telling stories about whatever. Interview the other family members. Get a sense of what this person was like. Like I said, I never knew him. So here's a picture of the oldest son who recently, by the way, just died at 99 years old. And here is a picture of him with his wife. And luckily his mother and father are right behind him in the same picture. Now that's not gonna happen a lot, but I have him with his parents and he's telling me what he liked to tell us about. His younger brother, look at this little younger brother, what a little imp he was, also now deceased. So I, I would have lost that, but the stories that he remembered, you can go on and on. And I interviewed each one of his children, four or five of them now are dead. So, but I got their stories of what, and it's interesting, everybody told something different. Everyone told something different. Well, the girls, one of the girls was saying that at the dinner table, all the boys sat on one side, all the girls sat at the other side, and the mother, mother always plated all their food. Another daughter will remember them going bowling. Another girl will remember them going swimming. And all the stories were different. And I hadn't said to them, well, tell me a different story because I heard that one already. I never had to do that. So that's kind of fun, rounding out the stories. Finally, the death. The cause of death. How old was he when he died? Where did he die? Was he in the hospital? Did he die at home? Where was he buried? Do you have a picture of the headstone? What about death certificate? An obit, funeral card, whatever you've got. I had an aunt who had funeral cards. They were like a deck of cards. Every time I called her, can you tell me when so-and-so died? And yeah, she would tell me. So one day I said to her, would you, when you don't need them anymore, I didn't want to say when you were dead, when you don't need them anymore, would you just put a little note on them to tell your daughter? She had one daughter. Everything that woman had, of course, should go to her daughter. And I said that. I said, but she's not going to care about these cards. Would you just put a little note and ask her to please send them to me? Of course, of course. Two weeks later, I got them. Just, she'll never send them to, she'll throw them out. So I have all her funeral cards. Okay, so here's the death of my grandfather. What happened, uh, where he was, what all the circumstances was, and then um, the headstone. What he died of, when he died of, how old he was, his headstone. Okay, and the final thing, it says the Italian immigrant who had lived his American dream, the naturalized American citizen had become a successful and wealthy businessman. Although he accomplished much to be proud of in a short lifetime, he died much too young. He really did. So that's the way I ended it. All right. Epilogue. We're getting to the end, guys. The epilogue. How did you feel when you were writing this? Like I said, I want this to be a wonderful experience. I want it to be a growing experience. If you're not a good writer, you're going to learn how to write. If you're not a good researcher, you're going to learn. If you're not as familiar with the computer and some of the technical skills, you're going to learn. But how did you feel about writing it, that you did grow? There was areas that you were uncomfortable with that you learned to overcome and you did the best you could. I've got, I felt I knew my grandfather better because of this. I wrote, was writing about him all this time and I felt I really got a handle on the man, what made him tick. Put that in there. What you learned? What did you learn? Do you learn computer skills? You learn writing skills? Put it in there. Describe the process, your emotions. All of that should all go in in the epilogue. Again, it doesn't have to be another book, one page. But what was it like? What was this process like? I started I like to start at the very beginning. I like the discipline. Start when they were born. And then it's a young person and go on, 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 on. Um, if you feel like writing about how they got married or how they met, do that. 
If you want to write, say, well, let me write, it's for, I just got the death certificate, let me write that. Fine. Again, there's no rules. But I, I like the discipline of starting from forcing myself to do the things that I need to do. You don't feel like doing that? You want to write something fun or easy? You've got all this military stuff? Fine. Whatever works for you. This is a fun project, whatever it works for you. Write in your trips to gather the information. I drove all the way down to St. John's in Queens to go visit the cemeteries. Or I went upstate New York to see where the house was that he lived in. Whatever you did, whatever trips that you went to gather the information, put it in. I know Bob Yates went down and, and revisited a lot of these, these sites with his family. And they're wonderful. And you, and you put those in there. You put that in there. It makes it, it makes it personal. Or what did it feel like you were confined? I know Jane's around you. You're finding all this stuff. You're going through closets. And she's going through closets. She finds a box of treasures. And in it, she found such and such. Put that in. Where did you get all these documents? I was confined because of the pandemic. And look at the treasures that I found. Lizzie just wrote and said, oh my God, look at the stuff that I just found. Some of it good, some of it not so good. Okay, but how did you find it? I was home during the pandemic. Okay. While you are writing, remember, be careful with your wording. Sprinkle heavily, I think. I believe, common for the time, the family story is, then I don't care what you write about a family story, as long as you're prefacing in it. I think they met through the two parents because the two fathers were in the same, or it would make sense that the fathers, because we're in the same business, the children may have met. They probably met because they were in the same street together. I believe such and such happened. Common for the time, they probably were not left alone until they got married and were dating or were double dating with an older brother or sister, whatever. Family story is. Then I don't care what you write. But be careful because it becomes fact. I have a hard bound book that very clearly states in it that my mother is a descendant from Garibaldi. Well, we all know just because it's on the internet doesn't make it true. But gee, this isn't a book. This is printed. This is hard bound book. No, it's not true. It's not even close to being true. And I researched it and found that out. So the family story is that he was descended, she's descended. No, they're not true. So um, be careful with that. So when you put something in a book, it becomes fact. Because it can say, well, gee, he's the genealogist. He would have known. So be very careful. My best research indicates, or in spite of my best researching, in, I cannot find. I had a student... He was so cute, Ralphie Baby, I used to call him this big, burly German man He used to serve at World War II. He could not find a document. I said, don't leave it out, don't leave it blank, because somebody's gonna read this and say, wait a minute, why did he include the marriage certificate? How come it's not in here? Because in spite of my best researching skills, I can't find it. So now you're admitting to people, hey, I can't find it, your turn. Because maybe in five years or 10 years, um, or two years, that document will finally get on a database. All right, then you can take this out and you can say, hey, it just after I had finished this, you go back and say in, 19, in 2021, a new database, I finally, after many years of searching, found the document I was looking for. Put it in there. Make this human. Make this human. And just keep writing. When you're writing on the computer, you have an extra space, it's going to show. If you've misspelled the word, it's going to show. It indicates red, blue, green, marks, all kinds of things. Spelling and grammar can come later. If I'm talking and then you stop me, and then I'm talking again, and then you stop me again, and you, I ask something, you're going to lose your train of thought. Type. Let those words come out. Just keep, keep typing. After you finish, or you need to catch your breath, or say, all right, now let me see what I've done, then you can reread it. It may be wonderfully written. It may be saying, wait a minute, what was I thinking? And you need to edit it. Or you make all those extra spaces or you correct those misspelled words. But that's at the end. Don't stop to correct a spelling word every time you type it. Get it all out while the ideas are flowing and then you'll find, you'll find yourself much more successful, much more productive. And as I said before, put yourself in the book. I drove to here, I went to see that. I took my family to see this. I took my mom here. Put that in the book. Make it your book. Okay? 
finish the touch. So now you've been working on this. Don't worry about it. I always say, don't worry about the spacing. Don't worry about the margins. Until you know what kind of paper you're going to put it in, you can't. So once you go to Staples, um, start looking and finding maybe a bordered paper, simple bordered paper, something simple. You're going to choose a font. Keep the font simple. Keep the font clean. I use Arial or I use um, Poor Richard. I love Poor Richard when I'm writing older stories. It's still legible, but it gives it a different kind of a feeling. If you want to look at a newspaper, you use a newspaper font, whatever. But choose the font, and then that's going to be consistent throughout every single page. The size is going to be consistent. Don't do 12 on one page and 14 on another. Um, when you're doing that, you want to keep your headings the same size also. Naturally, the headings are going to be bigger. If you want a fancier font for the chapter titles, sure, go ahead. Chapter 7, Military Life, and you want to do a different kind of font. But that has to be the same font throughout the book. You can. But when you're reading the body of it, keep it simple. You know that kid's principle. Go to special papers. Go to your local stationery store. Go to Staples. If they don't have a big selection, sometimes they have a catalog. Go through it. Find a simple border. You don't want something too wide. You can't fit a lot of words on there. And there's not a big selection out there, to tell you the truth. Then once you've got your border, your paper, now you can set your margin, margins and your font sizes. Keep it simple. You want a little bit of space. You don't want the words going right out touching the margins. You want a little bit of space there. So set those margins. Write it on a little, I write it on a little index card. Here's the font for the um, titles. Here's the font for the body. Here's the size. Here's my margins. So that now you can go through to click that from your pages is very quick. Okay. Then you can design a cover. And again, the cover can be whatever you want. You don't want Robert Ludlum and then the title of it. You want the name of the person you're writing about. Um, you can put a nice picture. And be thinking about a picture while you're writing. What picture of dad do I want to include or my grandfather? What do I want to put? Okay. Uh, then you're going to put the pages that are all typed out now on your fancy paper. You're going to put in a plastic sleeve and you put them in a loose book. Because again, if there's an error, on a page that you didn't catch the first time or a date that needs to be changed, it's easy enough to change that one page. And be sure to buy enough paper to have enough to write your book plus extra because you're gonna need to change that. Then you add your cover with the photo, put a spine on it and you are done. And you will have a masterpiece that you will be proud of. I don't care what your level of writing or computer skills are, this is going to be so spectacular for your family. Um, Here's two examples. These are two different papers. This one I think is still around. It's just a simple dark reddish mottled paper. And I put my grandfather, a man with a dream and written by him, a story of his life by his granddaughter. This one, walking in my grandfather's footsteps, a biography of him, this I put in a novel. Okay, so they can all vary. They can all vary. There's no hard, fast rule. You can put you, I could have put here Vito, his name first, and underneath it, I could have put A Man with a Dream, or I could have called this book A Man with a Dream, and then underneath, the story of my grandfather. I mean, I get crazy. I, I Make three or four choices. Make three or four layouts, and then think about them. Go away, think about them, come back in a week or two, because I see a question. Okay, I'll be right there. Because it can always change. Do something. You can always edit something. You can't edit a blank page. So I played with all the different ways I could have done that. Let's see the question. Uh, Susan, should I document where the pictures, documents, census records came from? No, who cares? A census record is a census record. Whether you went down to the National Archives and got it there, or you got it on Ancestry or Family Search, it's the same census. So something like that really doesn't matter where you got it, who cares? The, the fact is, oh, this is a very good question. Um, where did you get the document? You might want to say, I wrote away for my grandfather's um, marriage certificate and the lady in the church that I dealt with was really very nice. You can put that in. But this isn't a documentary. This isn't a, um, an official book. It's a story. So do you have to put down where they came from? No, not at all. I wouldn't bother to do that unless it's a, unless I, I found my father's old book and my mother had a beautiful book that she had put together for my grandfather. If that comes a story, yes. 
What do you do with the original photographs? Two things. One, scan them. As we are speaking now, they are all disintegrating. They're going to be fading. You've got old photographs, I'm sure, that are faded. Take my photo, a Photoshop class. We bring those back to life. The original photographs, one, should be scanned and then put in your computer and up in the cloud. And then the originals I put in um, archival safe sleeves and then put them in books, in loose leaf books. I don't put them in scrapbooks, take up too much space. So that's what I do with photographs. Uh, you should definitely say where the photo's from, Sarah. Um, why? If I have a book of old photos that, my, that I've inherited from my mother, my grandfather, does it matter where they came from? If my cousin was generous enough to share, she said, I got this beautiful picture of my aunt and uncle from my cousin, and that's a story, yes. But I don't want to fill this book taken from, found in, this was on the internet, this I got from here. That, I don't want to do that. If that's something you feel more comfortable doing and you want to say where the photos come from. So Sarah, tell me why you think, and I'm not disagreeing with you, I want to hear another side to this, why you think it's important to say, where, where does it matter where I got this picture from? It was in a pile of family photos. Does it matter where it came from? Unless my aunt was dying and she said, Tony, you're the genealogist in the family. I want you to have these. Yes, if it's a story. But so Sarah, tell me why you feel that way because I might be missing something and I'm, we're more than happy to share that. What photo editing software do you use and publishing software do you use? Okay, I use um, Photoshop Elements. I teach it in class. We're up to Photoshop Elements. I think it's... 19. It's a fabulous program. I enjoy very much. I was teaching it in Reading to a class in Reading. I know the Laverties were there. I forget Anne was there also. And I've taught several classes of it at Founders Hall. It's a fabulous program. You can do so much with it. The Elements program, not the full, full Photoshop, because Photoshop is a very expensive program. Uh, for graphic designers, you don't need that. You will never outgrow what Photoshop Elements can do for you. So um, uh, that's what I use. And what was the other question? All right, I, I just, this is all questions and answers. You definitely say where it came from. Oh, so Sarah's saying that's what bibliographies and indexes are for. Even though, <laughs> you're right. And Sarah, even though I'm a biology major, I have a master's in biology, and I understand being very, very careful with this, I don't want to take up a time. My, I have so many projects and lectures that I'm trying to do. I don't want to take up the time and I, I itemize every single photo in that book and tell me where it came from, from bibliography. This is not a textbook or an index where I say, well, this picture I got from my father, this was a picture that I had in my mother's album. And this picture I found that in my cousin. And I don't care. I don't really care. Um, they're all indexed. They're all scanned. That's the important thing. I think the more important thing is if they're scanned, that's important. I think um, to protect them, but I don't, I, I, would, I would never take the time to do a bibliography and list every single thing. Even when I'm reading a book, most of the time I don't check the bibliographies. I don't care where he got the information. He's got a whole documented that he was documented. Okay, good. You know, I mean, some of these writers are great writers. David, um, oh God, David, he writes this wonderful history book. He wrote the Brooklyn Bridge. He has a bibliography that's almost as thick as a book. I don't care. I know the man's a good researcher. I don't need to know where every single sentence that he came from got from. Okay. Um, so you need to document things so others can find them again. Well, if it's one of my pictures in one of my family albums, how is somebody going to find them? If it's from the internet, I will say this is a picture of a, of a barber shop that I found off the internet. But am I going to give the exact address, the, the uh, exact internet address of where I got that picture? God knows. No way. No way. But that's me. I want, to, I want this to be a creative, fun thing for you. And I think if you had to do a bibliography, it would be there forever. Um, what kind of photo scanner? Wait a minute. The second part of my question was, do you use a publishing software? No. Um, I, I do it on the computer. I do it on Word. I do it on Word. Publishing software. I am comfortable with Word. That's what I've gotten to use. So I write everything on Word and put it in. What kind of photo scanner to use? Always a flatbed scanner. Always flatbed. Never do a scanner that you can feed into 
When I say when you feed, I don't even know, well, they still make them, but you put a picture that's a one of a kind picture and you feed it in, eventually it's gonna eat it. Feeding means eating. So I always do a flatbed scanner. I have an Epson uh, uh, HP. I've had Epson. I don't care. I don't worry about that. You go to, you'll get something nice, but I like either HP or Epson. They have really nice scanners. I hope, um, I think Samantha, you're the one that's closing these out as I'm reading them. What about ads and generic pictures of a town pulled from the internet? Um, okay. What a, about them. I do pull them from the internet and I will say, you know, obviously I don't have pictures of the town from here. I know Carol Laverty went on the internet and she found beautiful pictures of old homes in Ireland at the time. So these were internet pictures. Okay. So she can say, I pulled these from the internet, but again, I'm not going to give the internet address of where I got them. There's just too many of them. And I go from one place to another, to another. There's, I don't want to slow down with the, you don't want to get lost in the, the tree for the forest and the forest from the trees. You want to be able to, this is supposed to be a fun project. So if you want to take the time to document all your pictures, that this was a family photo, this I got from the internet, fine. That's okay. I'm not, I don't teach it. I don't encourage it. If you want to do it again, there's no rules, whatever you like. Here, this is the one of my, but I love your questions. I love the questions. Uh, and I would have gotten to maybe some of them, maybe not. So I enjoy your questions. Here, I put a border around a picture. Again, where did I get this picture? It's been in their family. And my cousins are very generous with sharing. And we do things over the internet and they share pictures with me. So this says, these are the two people, the life through doc. This is the family, the aunt and uncle I never met. Their life through documents, photographs, charts, and stories. Lovingly prepared by their niece and my neighbor. Okay? So... I'm almost done, I promise. After I finished doing this, one of my students did a beautiful book on her father. She loved her father, beautiful book. This was her third or fourth book. And then her granddaughter, whom she was showing to, says, well, this is the way we love our grandparents. She says to her, grandpa, grandma, what about you? And I said, you know what? You're right. You got to write your story. So after you get rid of yours are harder because you have much more information. Start with somebody like a father or a grandfather. So you want to make sure that this, um, now you're going to capture your life. And I'm going to go through this very quickly. Remember going to the drive-in movies, going to the diners and putting the quarters in to listen to the songs, the silver trees, holiday time. I, I had a Tony doll. My favorite toy was a because my name is Tony. I would say I had a Tony doll. Favorite television shows like The Lone Ranger. Again, going to the card catalog. I was a great reader, loved biographies. So going to the card catalog on Saturday and, and taking books out of the library, capture your life in pictures. Remember, if you don't want your descendants to put a twisted spin on your life story, you better write it yourself. Write your story yourself. Okay, phew, that's a lot of information, I know. But break it up into little steps. It's a journey. Genealogy is a journey. This book is a journey. Enjoy every step. When it starts becoming hard or like you're feeling frustrated, stop. Either write something else or put together a chart or sort out a timeline or just walk away for it and come back the next day. So here's my email. Again, if you would like the outline, I would be very happy to send it to you. I'm just going to tell them I have a lecture. Hold on. I'm doing a lecture. Call me back in 15 minutes. Thank you. Um, Genealogy is a journey. I want you to enjoy this. Have fun. Send me an email and I will be happy to send you an ally. I promise you something. Oh, the other thing that I will send you, if you would like, I have a list of all the other lectures that are coming up that I'm doing, not necessarily on genealogy. I'm doing two famous uh, women who changed the world. I have a, I do a travel series. I'm doing one on India, one on the Galapagos. I do famous women. So if you would like a list of my upcoming lectures, which I have left for the end of for July, send me an email and I'll send you that too. Okay. Samantha, are there any more questions? No, um, I think you've managed to answer all of the questions, but there was this one piece of positive feedback I wanted to share with you. Uh, Deb Levinson said that she just started working on a research project with her 12 year old granddaughter. Hey, excuse me, what was her first name? What's her name? It says W. Deb Levinson. Okay, don't know her. Okay, hi, Deb W. W. Deb. 
she just started working on this research project with her 12 year old granddaughter. And she said that your lecture today will help them go beyond answering a simple um, and, and give them an objective. So she says, thank you very much. Wonderful. I had a woman who came to Reading, <coughs> excuse me, came to Reading, I'm, I'm, my voice is shot. <coughs> she came to Reading with her young son, young teenage son. And of course they were trying to prove that they were descended from John Adams. And she was very, oh, that's ridiculous and we're not and whatever. I said, you know what? But let's not discourage him. If he wants to see that out, let me show him how he needs to go about doing this. And we started with John Adams and we found his wife and all the children. And what happened, because it had to be a boy because the name was Adams. So we delim eliminated the girls and we went with the boys and we followed the line and followed the line. And he did this and he found out, not surprisingly, because Adams is a, obviously a common name, that he wasn't descended from them. So I said, this was a wonderful project. You know, you don't do an experiment knowing what the answer is. So she worked with him. He got a good handle on genealogy, knew what he had to do, became familiar with ancestry, and hopefully this will be a lifelong thing for him. So he learned. Did he learn what he wanted to learn, confirm what he wanted to learn? No, but that didn't matter. It was a wonderful experience. So if you can share this with a grandchild, the way Bob Yates is doing for one that I know, do it. Get them interested, absolutely. So thank you for your comment. Yes, and hopefully we'll start off and really get them going. Okay.